Hello everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Sarah Cornish and I am Project Director at Games for Change. We're super pleased to welcome you to our Games for Change Industry Circle Google Hangout with Amplify Games, a member of our 2015 Industry Circle. Today we will be hearing from Senior Product Manager Karen Wang and Creative Director Laura Vila. At about 12.50, so in about 20 minutes or so, we'll start an audience Q&A. And um, I will be moderating your excellent questions, which you can submit using the Q&A app in this Google Hangout or, or on Twitter using hashtag G4C Industry, where you can also follow along uh, with the conversation. So a little background on the Games for Change Industry Circle. Uh, our Industry Circle program aims to acknowledge the achievements and challenges in the growing social impact games sector. So we're recognizing some of the companies and entrepreneurs who are emerging as industry leaders, and we believe that um, identifying and sharing best practices and lessons learned from these exciting companies um, can hopefully inspire and invite others to forge new paths in this growing sector of impact games. So our 2015 industry circle includes Cognito, Amplify, Brain Pop, the Global Gaming Initiative, Glass Lab, Filament Games, and Shell Games. And uh, some of some of these um, companies have already had. Google Hangout uh, webinars for um, with live Q and A's as well, so you can go back to the Games for Change YouTube channel and see these recordings, uh, and we'll have the recording of this uh, Amplify session up there as well later this week. So we are very pleased to welcome Amplify. Um, Amplify is an educational technology company built on the foundation of wireless generation, which brought mobile assessments and instructional analytics to schools across the U.S. Amplify's digital products have supported more than 200,000 educators and 3 million students in all states across the U.S. And Amplify's products are helping reimagine um, learning, helping teachers teach and students learn in um, exciting new ways. Amplify's developed a ton of really awesome learning games, some of which Karen and Laura will talk about today, as well as curriculum and assessment resources for educators. So um, we may have some educators, some developers in our, uh, in our audience tuned in today on Twitter and here live. And so we anticipate some exciting questions for Laura and Karen. So um, thank you. I'm going to pass, uh, pass on to Karen and Laura to, um, to start their presentation. And, um, and again, please, um, you can start inputting your questions as they're talking. We'll, we'll hold for the Q&A for about 20 minutes. Um, and then and then start that after they speak. So thanks again, and uh, Laura or Karen, I will pass pass on to you. So thanks. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to join today, um, and we're going to be giving you a little information about Amplify Games and talking about our design process uh, as well as how we've implemented the games at, in schools throughout the country. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen so that we can give you um, a little bit of a taste of what the game's experience is like. So first, before we dive in, I just want to give a brief introduction of our Amplify Games portfolio. We have over 30 games designed for grades 4 through 9 that are intended to be supplemental to core curriculum, and we're going to spend a lot of time on today's Hangout talking about that. Our games are designed for ELA, math and science topics and skills, and are currently available for the iPad, although we will be expanding to other platforms in the future. So if you um, read the newsletter that the Games for Change folks sent out last week, uh, you know that our games are very much designed to extend learning outside of classroom instructional time, and that's what we really want to focus on in this Hangout. Um, you know, what we hear about from educated, educators is that students, unfortunately, don't really spend a lot of time doing their homework. Um, and we've seen this in different stats and research. One of the most interesting things that we saw um, is this stat that we have up on the screen here. Um, in talking with middle schoolers, what percentage would rather do any of the following than do their math homework? So who would rather take out the trash, clean their room, or go to the dentist? 
And that number is actually 84%, which is a really high percentage of students who would rather do these tasks that are not very pleasant than do, than do their math homework. Um, and in fact, math homework tends to get done more than homework um, for other subjects, like lang language arts. So we're really not in a great situation here. Um, and that's one of the problems that we're trying to solve for educators um, and administrators. So what are students doing in their spare time when they're not in school if they're not doing their homework? Uh, the answer to that seems to be screen time. Uh, in a recent Common Sense Media study, we see that tweens ages 8 to 12 spend almost four and a half hours on screens outside of school every day. Um, and for teens, that number goes up to almost six and a half hours. Uh, and that's excluding any use of screens for school or for homework, which uh, means that students are spending an immense amount of time on screens every day uh, outside of school. So what we want to do with our games is bring all these components together. Instructional time in class is extremely limited, but teachers can't count on students to do homework or extend learning on their own outside of class. Instead, they're on screens playing games. Uh, and so what we want to do is meet students where they are. For that reason, we've designed our games to be voluntary. And what we want is for students to play our games outside of class time to spend the time that they are on these screens outside of class uh, instead of playing uh, games that are not educational to be playing Amplify games, which are all tied back to specific learning objectives and standards. Uh, in order for students to actually choose to play our games in this voluntary manner, we partnered with wonderful commercial game designers around the world uh, so that they would bring their production value, their expertise in game design, so that these are really meaningful choices for students. These aren't just uh, educational games that smell like school. Uh, so as you can see here, you know, we have some critical uh, praise in terms of the quality of our games standing up to other commercial games. But really, we, we want to hear from the students. And fortunately, we have gotten top marks from these critics, the students themselves. For example, we heard from one student, a sixth grader in North Carolina, who told us, I've been playing games for my whole life, but I never knew there would be a game that I would love that was learning. That shocked me so much. It reminds me I'm just sitting home in my man cave, just playing and playing. And this is the this actual quote from the sixth grader who apparently has a man cave at home where he's playing lots of other games. So you can see from his um, experience with other games that he really is comparing Amplify to other commercial games that he spent a lot of time on. Uh, and he's enjoying the games. Uh, we also heard from another sixth grader, this one in Pennsylvania, saying, I didn't think I'd have a lot of fun doing math, but wherever, whenever I go on those games, it feels fun. Um, one of our favorite tributes uh, to our games is probably this walkthrough video for the math game 12 a Dozen. Uh, an anonymous student created and posted this video on YouTube completely of his own initiative. And you can see that some of his other game walkthrough walk videos are for Call of Duty, Minecraft, Grand Theft Auto, and he's obviously a big Super Mario fan. This just for us underscores the fact that Amplify Games can stand up alongside the most popular commercial games and students will choose to play them and enjoy them. But of course, in contrast to those other games, our games are mapped to standards at the middle school level. Um, and because our games are a supplement, this allows the games to be played anytime during the semester or school year. And educators can supplement the curriculum in a couple different ways using our games. The games can expose players to topics before they're encountered in the classroom, or they can reinforce concepts or topics that have already been learned about and give students extended skill practice after the lesson is passed. Our games are also designed to foster growth mindsets, a set of beliefs and attitudes that predict positive academic performance. Um, so for example, uh, here on the screen, you see 12 a dozen, one of our math games, and students can use the rewind button in order to try their math again. We've also designed uh, the games to have community features be a very big part of them, and that's a really big draw in terms of what students have enjoyed about our games. Um, so for example, what you're seeing on screen is Mob Rule, which is a fraction game, and students can play multiplayer matches against each other. Students can also create game levels for each other in several of our games. So for example, here in Code Breakers, they can create math puzzles for their classmates to solve. Uh, in Scriptus, uh, which is one of our language arts games, students are able to create stories um, and share them with their friends, leave feedback for each other, 
uh, and go through a revision process. Uh, multiplayer and these social features are really big for out-of-class playtime, which we'll go into in more detail later. So that's sort of a, a brief introduction to how we thought about what we want to solve for educators, educators and teachers through these games and how we came about putting together our game portfolio. To make sure that we were getting everything right, we created a playtesting program during development. So we spent three years playtesting with thousands of students. During this time, we put together eight to 10 week sessions so that we would work with these students over the course of those sessions. And we met with these groups of students weekly during the school year, and over the summers, we were, we were able to meet with them on a daily basis. Uh, we also put together enrichment programming. Uh, so we worked with the students to talk to them about what are game mechanics? How can you think about games critically? How would you design a game? Uh, and this all helped them to develop their feedback skills so that we got the most useful information and responses out of the students that we could. And in addition, it also sort of what their appetites for what a career in game design might look like, which is of great interest to this demographic. Uh, so that's sort of an overview of how we got uh, to where we are now. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Laura to speak about our current product. So on the current screen is uh, the app that we currently have available to schools. And we have them in, oh, sorry, okay. are you, you still got it up. Yep. And we have them basically divided into two sections. We have uh, an ELA bundle, which is our English language arts games. And then we have a STEM offering. And each of those has quite a wide variety of content within it. So we're going to go ahead and take a look uh, within those sections. First, we're going to look at the world of Lexica, which is our overarching game world uh, for our ELA games. Uh, we worked with Shell Game Studio to produce it. And it's a very rich world that takes place in the context of literature. Uh, so you actually go into books as these characters, the Curiosos, and you meet uh, characters from literature. And these characters are available both to go on quests and different journeys for you. They have a whole set of skills that you acquire as you engage with them and their texts throughout uh, the course of the game. The content is all episodic, so we give a specific episode to students every month. And as they have these skills, they get to go on adventures and uh, you know, help vanquish all sorts of creatures in this world. And the world is a real library. So you'll see all of these bookshelves with curated collections of books, which are available in an e-reader um, directly on the tablet. The, the books in our e-reader have a series of comprehension questions that come with them. And answering these questions uh, feeds information back into the game uh, for a whole series of conversations and reward loops. Uh, we'll see one here. This is the book oracle, who actually makes book recommendations to students based on what they're already reading. Uh, and you can see some of the awards that came from reading. This game world also actually taps into all of our other ELA embedded games. And those are games that you can link from, from Lexica. So Inkblot here is a morphology game. And this little creature goes around and swaps word parts um, and solves all of these different mysteries. Master Source is another great example. It's a spelling game where you use word tiles to spell words and battle against either your friends or opponents within the game. Twisted Manor is a vocabulary-based game. And in this game, your family's trapped inside a mansion, and you use words and the powers associated with them as you collect them. We have over 15 embedded games that are currently hooked in, into Lexica, as well as Scriptus, which is our storytelling game where you can build your own interactive stories, uh, set up entire settings. We have this great tool that outlines the story and lets you think a little bit about that process as well as create a rich interactive dialogue. Um, you can see there are quite a lot of options here <laughs> in, in the settings that we're showing off. Uh, but it's really a very robust tool. And you can share all these stories. So there's a nice community that can come out of uh, writing with your peers. And you can see someone here is leaving a comment for this story. And so Lexica is a pretty big experience. Yep. Oh. And now we're headed off to STEM games. Our STEM games uh, reinforce a variety of skills from on our math side. Um, it's basic operations, fractions, and all sorts of skill sets that lead up to algebra. And um, on science, we do uh, deep content dives into specific areas of uh, domain study. So let's take a look at a couple of those. Let's see here. 
All right, this is 12 a dozen. 12 is a uh, precursor to algebra game. Um, it's order of operations. And you play as this character, 12, who has the ability to change um, themselves into different numbers by taking uh, these little creatures that are floating around with it and adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing them from themselves. Uh, you have different powers depending on what numbers you are, and so he's, a four, he's got a four in him right now, so he's pushing the gruffle trump along, and these puzzles get quite complex. Um, one of the things that makes this really um, a great learning experience is this game has a rewind button. So anytime the math problem that's at the top of the page gets a little out of sorts and something isn't going quite right, it's not really a rewind button and give it another try. And we see lots and lots of use of this um, in, the, in the reporting that comes back to us. So it's, it's a great feature to have in there to encourage kids to just keep grappling with really tough math. And let's see. There he goes. All right. Mob Rule is a fraction-based game. Uh, in this game, uh, you're making uh, numbers add up to a whole, to one. And um, you can see we have mixed denominators in here. And this you can play against your friends. You can really, we've seen great competitions go on with this. Um, it's one of our very most popular uh, fraction games. Let's take a look here at one more. All right. And science. So SimCell is uh, a game all about the life of a cell, both animal cell and plant cell. And we're going to go in here with a nanobot and solve all sorts of different missions that are focused on the processes that go on inside, inside cells. So you'll see we have quite a few neat features in here. Um, right now, we're just exploring the environment. And we just pulled out a scanner. So everything within this entire 3D environment is scannable. And it doesn't only have the definitions, but it draws all the connections between all of the different organelles and components uh, that are required for the cell's processes to go on. So one of the things that was in that definition is that this lysosome is a virus killer. And so I'm now towing around a, a lysosome looking for a virus to take out. And I just got it but not before it had a chance to put its own DNA inside of the nucleus of the cell. So now we are going from the nanobot scale to the picobot scale, and we are actually inside the nucleus of a cell. Everything in here is scannable as well, and our mission right now is to destroy all of the cons conscriptors on the uh, DNA from this virus. And what is the transcription process? All of that, all of that information is in this game. And so there is really, this is just an incredibly deep dive into this topic where students can go well beyond what's in the missions to engage with the subject matter. So that's a little bit of a taste of some of our games. And I'm going to hand this back over to Karen. Great, thank you. So as I was saying, we wanted to give uh, an opportunity to share some of um, how we've used the games at other schools and programs around the country. Um, so the main way that we like to work with schools, sort of the ideal implementation model that we have, is for um, schools to do a one-to-one -one device use, which means that each student has their own dedicated tablet with the games loaded on it, and students can use this tablet both at school and at home and at night for weekend um, use as well. Uh, but we know that most schools don't actually have the capability to do this. And therefore, this means that we've also worked with schools on a variety of other implementation models in order to make the games accessible to students. So for example, there's a serial lending model that uh, we've used at some schools where they have a card of iPads, let's say 60 iPads with the games uh, loaded onto them. 60 students can take out those iPads, check them out like a library book in a way, use that tablet for about two weeks, then come return it back to the school, and another student can check it out to use the games in the Amplify library. Uh, or they could sort of renew it if nobody else is waiting for it, exactly like the lending library model uh, for books that schools are already used to. We also have worked with schools that have set up after-school programs or set aside time at lunch for students to come into a designated classroom and to use the games. 
Uh, we also talk with a lot of teachers who use the games as bell work or at the end of class period when they're done with their instruction. So they have extra time either at the beginning or the end of class where students can stay focused and continue working on academic uh, activities uh, even when they're not doing the classroom instructional activities. Uh, some schools, especially ones with blended learning models, also set up stations or learning centers where the students can have the uh, opportunity to play the games um, on iPads that are set aside for these stations. Uh, and some schools have decided to offer the games as rewards based on their own reward system within the school context. Uh, of course, with any of these kinds of models, we also allow students to use the games at home on personal devices. So if anybody has uh, an iPad at home, because their game progress is uh, associated with their account, they can use a school iPad while on school premises, and then they could continue playing the games at home on personal device that their family owns. Uh, but bringing us back full circle to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this Hangout, the best implementations are the ones that allow students ample time to engage with our games in their free time outside of class, especially at home. And we found that when students provide access to devices for this purpose, then students find a multitude of ways to make use of them. So we've talked with students who use the games at home by going to each other's houses in order to play multiplayer matches. Uh, or they play multiplayer games against siblings or other family members in the same households. Uh, we've even heard from students who are teaching younger siblings how to play certain games. For example, one student uh, told us that her little brother is not very good at math, especially fractions, and so she introduced him to Mob Rule, one of the games we sh showed earlier in this Hangout, and now his math skills are around fractions particularly are improving. Uh, it's great to hear these kinds of stories from students. Uh, in addition, our games are all designed to be played offline without an internet connection because we know you can't always count on a strong network connection either at school or at home. So we have also heard from students who don't have internet access at home who have found the ability to play our games to be a great boon for them in order to continue playing these games and reading the books in our Amplify library offline. And when schools enable students to have this kind of access to the iPads outside of class, that's when we see the most transformational moments. Students who are not just dealing with the learning components of the games because the game quality is good and enjoyable, but they're actually embracing the learning itself. So for example, we heard from one seventh grader who said, Lexica has helped a lot. You read these books and it helps you see how good authors can write. So you see how you should improve your writing skills off of them. We heard from another student who said, 12 helped me realize that you could do anything with numbers. Um, and these are really, these are really the moments that we live for uh, because here students are not just sort of choking down the learning because they like playing the games, but they're actually being inspired to learn and discover and sort of think of themselves as learners, as readers, and as writers outside of the confines of the game experience. So that was a brief overview of our games. Um, and I hope that uh, you all uh, have plenty of questions for us. We're happy to answer any of your questions. OK. Great. Thank you so much, Karen and Laura. Um, and so just a reminder to our viewers, you can enter in your questions um, for Karen and Laura using the Q&A button. And so if you look at the left side of your screen, there's a stack of icons, and there's a um, little speech bubble icon. If you click that, it'll open up a panel on the right of your screen where you can enter in questions um, that we can that we can ask. Um, so we do we have a few questions um, to start out with, and so um, to uh, to address a point that you brought up in the newsletter, the Games for Change newsletter, um, you talk a little bit about how you partner with really talented, you know, world-class game developers and game designers. And um, you didn't talk much about that here, and so I'd love to hear how you kind of locate th this type of talent and engage and recruit um, developers to actually create these, um, these wonderful learning games. If you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. We've worked with um, game designers all over the world, um, and uh, they range from game designers uh, who are in the US to also um, South America and the UK. Um, and we really wanted to work with game designers who 
um, or have already proven themselves in the, the space of commercial games. As, as we mentioned, we really wanted the games to be um, enjoyable for students and offer them a meaningful alternative to other games um, that they might be playing in their spare time and their copious amount of screen time as we discuss that they're spending outside of school. Um, so in some cases, we identified specific vendors that we reached out to because we felt like they really fit the bill and we thought they would be a good match for us. Um, Laura, do you want to uh, expand on that? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, it's also fair to say that, you know, we go <laughs> to a lot of uh, conferences and we're always looking for people who are showing natural interest as well in making learning games. And sometimes that doesn't come in the form of a traditional learning game. Uh, a great example is the developer who uh, worked on SimCell, the science game we showed today. Uh, when we met them, they had a game out on the market that they had put together that had an incredibly, uh, uh, really robust physics engine that was for fluid dynamics. And they spent a lot of time talking to us about how, you know, it took them so much time to figure out how to get that as realistic as possible and they had this very clear interest in, in simulation um, and they turned out to be a fantastic partner uh, for making a game that was simulation based in nature. Um, so you know we're always looking for kind of that natural uh, lean towards the, the areas of interest. Um, the same with uh, the, some of our math games where we had people who had really inventive ideas um, already of their own that we help nurture them through a process and make sure that you know that we can get them the play testers at our you know age and demographic to make sure that we're kind of tailoring and honing the game uh, to the right place but um, a, a lot of times the developers are really bringing wonderful ideas um, to the table that we're uh, eager to engage with. That's great thank you and, and do you have is it challenging to recruit developers over from you know bigger commercial studios? I've heard from a couple of other learning game companies that you know this can prove sort of a, a challenging um, ground. And so I'm curious if um, sort of what your strategies are for making you know making the opportunity to work on games for young people and games for learning um, something you know a compelling case for a developer to. Sure. Well, we've worked with a lot of independent designers. Um, and oftentimes, even though education games aren't necessarily their bread and butter or what they do all the time, um, it is something they really want to give a shot. And so it has been the case that um, for a large portion of our games um, that they didn't necessarily have a lot of pre-existing educational games. Now, that's not true for all the companies we worked with. We have some who have been in the space a long time. Um, but in general, um, that is how we've gone about kind of broadening what we do. And I think there are more games out there um, that have the potential to be turned into or are nurtured into educational games than maybe are traditionally thought of. Um, you know, we've worked with uh, certainly the Columbian studio that, that was mentioned uh, by Karen. That, that group, they had a game out, you know, it wasn't being used as a traditional education game in the sense of um, you know, being a vocabulary game, um, but we saw the potential for it to be that and, um, you know, help them strengthen it in ways that really brought that to the forefront and, you know, we're really happy to have it in our portfolio. Um, so it, it's, a, it's kind of a, pr a process of both uh, cultivating um, the games in, into that space, but also um, just really looking for what people already are bringing to the table. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Um, so you spoke about students choosing to play Amplify games in their free time. Uh, when, when they go home, uh, at school, if they've got a free period, how does Amplify or the school um, usually sort of introduce the game to students? Or can you talk a little bit more about, you talked about the great um, serial iPad lending program. Um, how, how do students sort of become aware that the games are, are an option? Um, and is there? Do you have any kind of more tips for perhaps some of the the educators and maybe even parents watching right now? Sure, uh, I can take that one. Um, uh, so we worked with uh, schools um, in order to sort of do these uh, rollouts at the beginning of the school year when they're ready to launch the games or at the beginning of the summer if it's a summer program. Um, and so we have components for both the teachers and the students. Um, speaking to the students first, that was the, the crux of that question. Um, we like to do launch events with the students to introduce them to get to the games. Um, based on 
all the playtesting that we did that we talked about earlier, years of playtesting with thousands of students, uh, we feel that the games are set up in such a way that once a student starts playing, they can get into it pretty easily. It's, it's very intuitive, um, and of course, could spend lots and lots of time on screens and playing games already, so it's not like we're teaching them a new language. This is their native language. Um, but there's a lot about the games that we want them to discover and take advantage of. So what we like to do is, if possible, actually go to the school um, and host an after-school event. Students can sign up. There's pizza. There's games. It's a fun party. It's a launch party, basically. Um, and the main thing we do is just have them play the game. So we might present for about 10 minutes at the beginning, but then the rest of the time, um, you know, at least 40, 50 minutes, sometimes even a, a full uh, hour and a half after that is dedicated for students just to play the games. And then we are there to answer questions for them um, and point out certain things that they might not otherwise notice, especially components that we want to drive them back to um, specific academic uh, goals. And so if they're in Lexica, for example, we want to point out some of the loops back to the library um, and that kind of thing. Uh, throughout the school year, we also like to create opportunities to keep communicating with the students. So at some schools, we have uh, student game squads, uh, which uh, are kind of like one of the schools described it as almost like a student council, but it's all about the games. So students who are not naturally always in leadership positions at the school have found their way into these game squads. They sign up to essentially act as the go-to experts in the school around our games. So they're there to answer their peers' questions about the games, as well as to help organize activities like multiplayer tournaments. Um, which have been really, really successful. So students gather after school and play multiplayer against each other, and there's uh, all the competition and one grand prize at the end, um, and they really enjoy that kind of thing. Uh, sometimes we'll give them posters um, or polls that they can display in the hallway or in classroom bulletin boards uh, asking, um, you know, which kinds of games they like to play best and that kind of thing. And so the game squad helps to run those activities and um, we are in touch with them throughout the year um, on all these different kinds of initiatives that they're doing at the school. Um, so we're giving one group of students the opportunity to uh, engage all the rest of the students at the school through a program like that. Uh, and in addition, we want to work with the teachers to make sure that they're keeping their students engaged and excited about the games. So we provide various materials to them, um, including uh, a deck or presentation that they can use at the beginning of the school year that includes um, the trailers for some games, some of the uh, material that you saw um, playing over the video um, today in our Hangout, um, to get the students interested. Uh, in, in the games, and we like to provide those kinds of um, uh, information to teachers throughout the year to share with their students uh, to keep them engaged and excited. Uh, we also have um, forums or message boards where we can communicate with the students throughout the year. Um, we, we would never expect students to pick up a phone and call Amplify Customer Service if they had a question or they wanted to know how to get past a certain point in a game. That's not something that uh, you know, a middle school or whatever do. So we have these message boards online that we're monitoring every day, um, and that's another way for us to keep in touch with the students and also to give them tips and push out some fun behind-the-scenes tidbits to, again, get them interested in the game. So sometimes we share things like, um, you know, concept art so they can see what all the environments in Lexica looked like when we first just drafted them and had these sketches, uh, things like that. That's great. Thank you. Just thinking that the Games for Change community at large should take take hint at the idea of after school launch parties or after work launch parties for our games. I think that's a, that sounds super fun um, and a great way to engage young people. Um, so we're also curious how you, how do you decide which subjects and skills to actually cover in your games? Do you do you take clues from curricular standards and state standards, or do you work with educators to understand um, you know what what they're having uh, challenges teaching in class. Um, how do you how do you make those choices? And then do you actually engage with um, how do you engage with educators or learning experts um, to kind of start game development? Sure, I can take this one. Um, so s certainly. Um, all of the above. Um, you know, we do work with educators and um, curriculum specialists. You know, being part of the larger group at Amplify, 
Um, you know, there's a whole part of our company that is focused on curriculum design. Um, also, just uh, historically, wireless generation um, had um, its own history with um, access to a lot of uh, historical student data. And one of the things, certainly, um, that we came to understand was that, uh, you know, to make an impact for ELA, um, it was really going to be reading. Um, that we had lots and lots of data that as well as um, there's a lot of it out there um, in, the, in the public sphere about the summer reading gap and the idea of trying to get kids to read more um, than what their average uh, amount of reading is per day. And so to support that um, for our skill-based games, we focused on syntax, vocabulary, and spelling um, as main skills that support um, making kids better readers. Um, that along with an accessible library of books um, you know, where we focus on gateway books, which are books that hopefully we think will uh, bring kids into having good reading experiences and then um, help guide them through a path of taking on more and more challenging books over time. Um, so that was definitely how, how we thought about the shaping of our ELA portfolio from a very literacy-focused um, perspective. Uh, for STEM, it's a bit different. Um, our games are really deep dives. There was way too much content to say we were going to cover it from you know, the very first math skill to the very last one, or all of the domains of science as well. So we really focused on taking um, very specific skills or very specific content areas and just you know, fully fleshing them out saying that if we're going to do a game about animal cells, we're going to show you every conceivable part of it in connection and really let you live in that world. Um, and so we have games that are about being inside ant colonies and you know, all sorts of different um, both environment and experiential experiences for science. Um, you know, we also have games that focus on some of the more um, you know, technology and uh, engineering ends of things as well. Um, but they're each kind of um, a little more narrowly focused and not necessarily uh, interconnected across the games in the way that the ELA games are. So they are different approaches and it, it is intentional on our part. And we know quite a bit about you know, how uh, those subjects are taught as well. For instance, uh, you know, s science skills um, in middle school can be taught in, in different orders depending on what state you're in. And so we didn't sequence those games in any uh, particular way for there to be a progression through them. And that was intentional. Um, that's, a, that's a little bit about those. And definitely for math, we focused on uh, things that were precursor skills to algebra, knowing that that's a, a very common um, stumbling block area for kids and that you know making sure that there's a successful path to that and that skills that you need along your way that you may have not gotten as firmly or are you know still needing to polish up on as you're approaching that that kind of coursework um, was really where we thought we could make a, an impact um, with getting kids to spend more of their free time on those skill sets. Great, thank you. So the next question comes up, um, I think it's come up on every single uh, industry circle hangout we've had thus far um, about business model. And so uh, for those viewers who aren't familiar with, um, with Amplify, could you talk a little bit about your, um, your funding model, how you kind of have created a, a sustainable business model around your products, and, um, and maybe some tips for those uh, learning game developers out there, um, how Amplify sort of has, has created um, a really strong, strong model. Sure. So, um, we're, what we're what we've done is we've created this portfolio of games for um, for schools uh, essentially. And so, one of the decisions that we made was in, was that we wanted it to be supplemental to the curriculum because we didn't want it to be something where um, we had to face sort of an uphill battle where schools were not ready to switch over to um, necessarily replacing an entire curriculum. Um, and that was a deliberate choice uh, and, and also aligned very well with the research that we were just discussing earlier about um, the need to create ways for students to engage and extend their learning outside of classroom instructional time. So it all sort of came together in that way. Um, I think that that was one thing that, that worked uh, to our advantage. Um, 
uh, you know, the other thing is that we, we will be exploring um, possibly, um, you know, commercializing the games uh, for also a non-school audience. We do have one game, 12 a Dozen, um, which we showed some footage of during this Hangout that is available directly for purchase um, uh, through just through the App Store. Um, and so individual parents, for example, could get the game that way uh, without it having to be a purchase through an institution like a school or a district. Uh, and we have heard the question from many parents, uh, how can I get these games? Um, parents who have installed the games on their iPads and, and call in to amplify customer service and say, I want this for my child, how do I get this? Uh, so that is also something that we'll be exploring as well. Okay, great. So which, which of your games do students like the best? Or maybe the teachers like the best? Can you talk a little bit about just what seems to just take off um, among your players? Sure. Uh, it's, it's really um, interesting we've seen as a common thread the, the multiplayer games and the games with the social features are the ones that students have flocked to the most, which is actually not really surprising uh, when you think about it. And that's why we designed to have so many social and community opportunities woven throughout the game experience. Um, so it's not always necessarily um, about the, the topic of the game, which is also great because it means that uh, a student who would not necessarily play a math game, for example, is spending lots of time playing Mob Rule because they want to play against their friends, and that's one of our multiplayer games. And in the process, they're practicing their fraction skills. Um, and so we really find that that is uh, a common thread in terms of what's the most popular. Um, and we've heard from teachers, uh, it's really exciting that students form kind of a camaraderie around playing the games together. So um, in addition to using the social, the digital social features, they're also gathering around tablets together, um, helping each other out, um, giving each other tips and, and challenges, even in person. Um, and teachers have seen all of that, both the digital uh, social components and the in-person uh, social gameplay, uh, teachers have said that they've seen that kind of camaraderie translate into um, other times during the school day that are unrelated to the games altogether, like during group work uh, in academic classes. Um, so we've seen that that's really uh, what has been the most uh, popular and what students have responded to the most from our games. Okay, great. Um, so if you have any final questions, go ahead and enter them in now. Um, otherwise, Karen and Laura, any, any final thoughts to close with? Thank you so much. Oh, great. Thank you for having us. This has been a pleasure to, to join um, and be part of the inaugural industry circle. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much to Karen and Laura for your time and your insights. Um, you can ask further questions if, if anything comes up over the next few days um, by just posting them on our Google Hangout page, the event page, or, um, or you can email them to contact at gamesforchange.org or tweet at us, of course, um, and we'll make sure to pass those questions on to Karen and Laura uh, to answer them later on. So this, um, this live Hangout was also recorded, and we'll be posting it onto the Google, the Games for Change um, YouTube page uh, later this week. So you can tune in if you if you came in a little bit late. You can watch the whole recording uh, later on. And then um, finally, a quick plug for the Games for Change Festival coming up in uh, June in New York City, June 23rd and 24th. Um, we invite all of you to come attend this festival. Um, we have three tracks of programming this year, one of which is our second annual Games for Learning Summit. So a lot of um, what, we, what we all talked about today um, will be talked about um, again on stage at the festival. So um, it was wonderful to talk to you both, Karen and Laura. Thank you so much. And, um, and uh, yeah, take care. Hope to tune in next time. Thank you. Bye.